Okay. Hey, I'm doing good. 
Um, being a father has really just made me, you know, I'm kind of grow up. I care about not their imperfections, not their perfections, but just their character. I feel a responsibility for him and towards him. You kind of have to say, I'm gonna sacrifice, I'm gonna give up my time. I think being there through everything, good stuff, bad stuff, but just being there. I wanna make sure every single day that I'm doing the right thing, like he has a superhero that he can look up to. He's very special. If someone asked me before, like, a thousand bucks, he's priceless to me. You always take care of me. Oh. Chris makes me feel safe, because he was always there to support me. He just is always going above and beyond for us and loving us when he didn't have to. He chose us, and that just means all the more to me. He was 25, and he chose to take on the position of, of being our dad. When he came into my life, I was still very young, so I actually didn't even notice that he wasn't my biological father. Chris is kind of like my dad. I can't really imagine a life without Chris. If I were to have a different grandpa, it would be way different. He helps people, and I want to help people like me. You know, a father is someone biologically that, you know, brought you into the world, but a dad is that person that loves you unconditionally. Thank you for showing us what love is. It has nothing to do with DNA. It's who you choose to love. Come up, come up here, uh, Johnny. Let me get you. I went to uh, a new surgeon uh, Friday, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm looking at two more surgeries uh, in Durham, Duke, and, um, and I was kind of, you know, after eight surgeries, you know, two more, yeah. Wayne, <laughs> uh, it's not too good a news, but you know, the Lord's been with me the whole time. Mm -hmm. But I just had to say this morning on Father's Day that uh, I'm glad to be a father of three children. And I love for them to come to my house and cook out and have fun together. And but I, when I looked out this morning and which one of them drove me here today, but um, I've seen all three of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my children's in heaven today uh, as a baby. And I'm glad to see them in my house, but I'm really glad to see them in God's house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if we got another home we're going to one day. Absolutely. And I want them to see them there too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's something to get tore up about. Absolutely. But I tell you, I'm happy. Tears sometimes, it's joyful tears. And, uh, but I'm just uh, thrilled that uh, they in God's house this morning. And we all gonna be in a home one day mm -hmm. and it's gonna be eternal. <laughs> and our Father is God. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just wanted to praise his name today because mm -hmm. he's everything. If you got him, you got everything. <laughs> if you don't have him, you don't have nothing. Mm -hmm. We need him more than anything. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you so much. <laughs> You know, I, in fact, uh, Johnny, just in, in, in line with that, I, um, I've had to do a few, a few funerals in my lifetime. <laughs> and the one thing I remember about the fathers, the funeral of the fathers, is the biggest gift. I wish, I wish they could get this. The biggest gift, those fathers that had passed on, the biggest gift they could give their kids is their own salvation because when you've lost someone close one you know you need comfort and you can provide that comfort 
by having and modeling a relationship with Christ in your own life so that they know that they'll see you again. I know a, we, each, of, each of us are in a different place with maybe where our parents are in here. I can't assume that we just all had parents that we're going to see in heaven one day. We don't, we don't know that. But I can tell you this. That's one amazing gift. And yes, to be a father who models for their kids what salvation and what, what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ, you can't ask for more. In fact, the strength of a father's presence. Children who have involved fathers have a strong foundation for well-being. And, and I'm getting this information not for, and, and I'm not even sure if this is a Christian organization I drew this information to hear from, but this is the, the Fatherhood Initiative. And, it, and some of the things they say that children with involved fathers have a strong foundation for well being, they are at lower risk for a host of poor childhood outcomes, infant mortality, low birth weight, emotional and behavioral problems, neglect and abuse, injury, all of these things they're at a lower risk for with a, with a father who is present and active in the home. When men become dads and are involved in their children's lives, they transform them in many ways. They're, the, your kids, they're, they're happier, they're, they have better physical and mental health, they live longer, unless you misbehave. <laughs> they live longer, have less depression. And some of these even have increased self-esteem. They, they realize because you as a father are going to be teaching your child who they are in the image of Christ and that they have value and they have worth. It says even here you're, you're more apt to be involved outside of the home in activities, civic groups. You're more apt to find a stable job. You, you, bet, you manage money better. You have better family ties. All of those things revolve around being a present father today. Now, I'm going to give you some, some points at the end of the message today about those things that, that fathers should be and do. And, uh, and, take, and this is a great, that would be a great time to take notes on that. And, but we're basing this around, of all things, and, and I started not to use this, but uh, it just, it's so appropriate to go into the, the Gospel of Luke. So today, if you have your Bibles, uh, start turning to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the book of Luke, and uh, it's one of the synoptic gospels, and go around chapter 15. What we're going to hear is a little bit familiar, but uh, hang out at Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, in Luke, in, in, if I could give you kind of a quick synopsis of the, the gospel of Luke, it's the theme, the theme of the gospel of, of Luke is this, that Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and save that which was lost. That Jesus came to save that which was lost. An outline of the book of Luke will have, uh, will go into the birth of Christ and his preparation for ministry. And, and it will even go into his time in Galilee, in Jerusalem. And we will even go into the resurrection and ascension of Christ. The Gospel of Luke narrates the ministry of Jesus as told by Luke, who was uh, a, a companion of Paul according to, to, to tradition and sometime later in the late century. So the Gospel of Luke uh, is written by who? Luke. Very good. Y'all are sharp cookies. Okay, the Gospel of Luke. All, all that we're talking about will happen in, in the areas that you're familiar with from Capernaum Nazareth, Nain, Jericho, all of these different areas. And the timeline that we will be in will be the time in Jesus' ministry when he begins, commences that ministry. And we're, we're going to talk today about a particular parable that Jesus told. 
uh, in his ministry and how, and how he shared this story about how he knew how important fatherhood was in, in his life. We think the Gospel of Luke was written around probably 60 or 65 A.D. So this is the timeline behind when the, when the book was written. And we're going to pick up in ch chapter 15 of Luke around verse, uh, around verse 11 of chapter 15 of Luke. This is a familiar story that we're going to hear because we're back to that story that April uh, kind of set up for me here. Because we're talking about this son that this father had, this prodigal son who decided that he wanted to get his riches now like and go and do whatever he wanted to. And, uh, and, and so we're, but we're not going to emphasize as much the son as we are the father in this case. The father's reaction to the different components to this story. In eleven twelve, it says, and he said, Jesus said this, there was a young man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the, sh the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So the, the father, I, and I don't know how this conversation may have, have went as Jesus shares this example, but the way Jesus makes it sound it, it seems like the father did not, may, may have been disappointed that he asked for it, but also in culture and tradition, the son had a right to ask for it. He could ask for it. And, and the, he, he, it may not have made sense to the father, but he followed the tradition and the custom, and probably the father knew his sons. You know what, he seems to have had a good relationship with both of his sons, so I, I'm sure that he knew that this son in particular, who knows, may have done this one day, may have come to him. He knew this son probably had a propensity to, uh, be, uh, to make rash decisions. He may have known that. But in any case, the father gave the son his inheritance knowing what the outcome could be. He did it. Do you think he loved him any less because he did it? Because he was just like good riddance? No. But the, the father knew that potentially this, the, giving him this money and this kind of a responsibility would be like giving a son who speeds a lot in a car when he drives a, a, a Lamborghini and saying, here. Because he knew that there was going to be a problem with self-control and probably discipline, and yet he did it anyway. He knew that something may occur and all he could do was ask God to protect his son in whatever case that he was in. So in 13, it says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there, what did he do? Squandered his property in reckless living. Squandered it. Probably had, you know what, it, it's amazing how many new friends you have when they found out you won the lottery, isn't it? It's like you have relatives that you, you never knew existed when you win the lottery because they're going to come out of the woodwork. And so you, you can see here this son, like the attention that he was getting, it says here that according to the way that he was living, he went to a far country probably because he didn't want to get, go too close to home because people would know what he was up to. So it says here that he literally lived recklessly, lived recklessly. In fact, he spent his money down to the last penny. Got so hungry here, it says here that he did some things he thought he would never do. It says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed the pigs. That's pretty low. Not, not just feeding animals, but the fact that this is a son who had everything, had potential, had, could, could have done anything he wanted to do. And there was a moment probably in his life that there was nothing he couldn't afford, and now it's gone. We need to realize that too. With 
in, in the economy that we live in, in this nation, we once and, and still are the greatest nation in the world, but the fact is you can't always count on having what you need the next day or the next week or the next year. It's a, it's a very, very uncomfortable place to be. Son had reached a point in his life where he, he didn't know what else to do. 16 says, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. He literally was to that point in his life. He literally was eating pig's food. Now, let me be the first to say I'll enjoy bacon any day, but I don't want to eat what they eat. It says, and no one gave him anything. He had literally reached rock bottom. And it's sad that we have to get there, by the way, for God to get our attention. Sometimes, isn't it? That we have to reach the point that we're at literally rock bottom before we listen I always say that some, in many cases, uh, faith doesn't grow in a house of plenty. I still believe that. If many times we get our eyes off of what's important. In this case here, the, the prodigal son, the son literally was eating pig slop, pig, pu pig, pig husk or pods. And he began to think about being back home. He says, but, but he came to himself. He came to himself. He finally came to his senses, it means. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. He literally felt so lost. He's away from home. He's in a far country. And he, he thinks, I've got to come up with a plan. Let me tell you, if you hit rock bottom, the first thing you better do is come up with a plan. Or come up with a plan. Instead of doing the same things over and over and over again, come up with a plan. We work with the homeless a lot here at our church, and I personally work with them, uh, in, even in our neighborhood uh, here quite a bit, some that just have nothing in their, their lives are in a constant cycle. It, it's nothing changes. They've come to accept that the way that they live is just how it's got to be. They run to, to alcohol in what we call 40s. Anybody here who know, know what a 40 is? Raise your hand. You're not confessing anything. It's okay. That's all right. They, you know, a 40, a 40 ounce, or, actually it's 42 ounces. But if you run over to any place, you can pull an extra out of the, out of the fridge over there and, and, and you have a 40 of beer. But that's what they do. They run to it. That's their comfort. They, they're in a cycle that won't change. And, and nothing's going to change in their life. And, and when you hit rock bottom, it's necessary to come to your senses and think, I need a plan to get out of where I am. I need a plan. And that's kind of where, where the son has finally, finally come. He's finally come to that place. In 18, it even says that I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So treat me as one of your hired servants. He literally had reached a point of humility in his life and for him to say this I don't think he was trying to manipulate his father he literally said this is where I am this is how I feel I feel like I'm unworthy to be your son father I am unworthy to be your son do you understand that each one of you before you came to Christ were at a place where you should have felt unworthy to call out to God as Father. You look at your life and you see what you've done. You see where your addiction took you. You see where your, your sin has 
taken you. Your immoral living has taken you. And, and you're literally thinking to myself, why would God love me? Why would my, why would my quote unquote, my Father in heaven, why would the Father of, of all the universe in heaven even show me the time of day? I'm unworthy. And yet, the son had reached a point where he says, I'm, I'm going to go to my father and tell them, only treat me as a hired servant because I do not feel worthy to be your son. And yet, and yet, in Romans 5, 8, God commended his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He said, I want a relationship with you because you are mine. I am your father and I will, I will receive you. That's the kind of love that we have from the father. It says, now the next morning, 2021, he, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His father evidently had been waiting at the gate every day probably spending much time in prayer praying that his son would return to his senses that he would return home the father did not care what the son had the father loved the son so much he just wanted him to be with him that's all he wanted how little to ask He sees him a long way off. It says that the father didn't just walk to him saying, it's about time you got home. That's not the way he acted. It says he ran and he, he embraced him, he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father didn't hear one word he said. Because he loved him unconditionally. The father begins to have his servants come and put a robe on him, put rings on his hands, shoes on his feet, and, and he wants to celebrate. He wants to celebrate that his son has returned home. And that's what they did. They celebrated and they celebrated. 24 says, For this my son was dead. Because he thought, he didn't know, for all he knew, he was. But he says, and he is alive again, and he was lost, and he is found, and they began to celebrate. The older son wasn't real happy about it, but I really don't want to emphasize that right now. Let's, we'll let the older son kind of, we'll let him simmer in his, in his jealousy right now, <laughs> okay? But I want to look at what are the traits of this father that we see what can we draw from this i hope that each one of you when you have your quiet times in your bible studies journal some of your thoughts and ideas about the scriptures you're reading and put your questions in there too but in this case here i think this is a good place to, to list some of the traits of a good father the traits of a good father what is what is different about this father that isn't like every father one of the traits of a good father is this, that he, rages, he raises his children to love Christ. He raises his children to love Christ. Now, why do I say that? Because there, there was a day in time that Sunday was considered sacred. That we modeled that behavior, our fathers we were modeled that behavior of bringing their family together in kind of a church setting each week. And, and it was something that was a way to spend time helping them to understand and nurture and love Christ, learn to love Christ. Maybe they had some devotional times at home with their kids where they all came together and they spent time and the father was able to share with them the, those things. We find that in Joshua 24, 15 about 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We'll teach them when they lie down and when they raise up. We'll always teach them to follow Christ. But it's important that we teach our kids to love Christ, the trait of a good father. The one, uh, the, the, one of the primary traits of a good father that we see from our Heavenly Father is His love is unconditional. His love is unconditional. His love has nothing to do with something that their, their kids do, their t- his children do. He loves them unconditionally. It doesn't matter what they've done. He loves them unconditionally. He also does this. He will lead his family, his children, by example. The trait of a good father is he will lead his children by example. You can't tell your kids that you think having a relationship with the Lord is important if they never see you crack open your Bible or bow your head in prayer ever. If all they see you crack open is, is, a, is a 40 or a can of beer or, or, or some, some particular... So, how are they ever going to know what you really love? To them, I tell you, they know what you love. Your children know exactly. I tell you, fathers, your children know exactly what you love, regardless of how much you try to hide it. They know. Also, the traits of a good father is nothing his children will ever do will make him love his children any less. Praise God. I'm glad that our Heavenly Father thinks that way. Another trait is this. And and listen closely to me. Fathers, a good father practices being present. Now, I don't mean just being present like with your physical body sometime. Because if you're sitting... Uh, in your physical body there and and, uh, your focus is completely somewhere else, then that's not being present. I'm talking giving your children your full attention. They know that they can come to you with anything and and they can be open to you and you will listen to them and you will pay attention. You'll be present with them. It's important. A good father also never gives up. We learned this from the story we just heard. He never gives up on his children even when what I, practicing what I call tough love. Maybe your child has crossed a line and and you know, and it's something you've had to take action on, discipline, disciplinary action as a parent. But regardless of that, you don't you're not giving up on your children. You never give up on your children even when you practice that tough love because it gets when it gets down to it the father never gave up on you never so today we celebrate the fact that we have a good good father we have a a father who loves us unconditionally And that, not only that, but he's modeled it for us. He's given us examples throughout the scripture. And he's given us the privilege and ability to be that good, good fathers. Fathers, today, I'm I'm, I'm here to say, maybe if there are some things you need to work on, work on them. I don't care if you're a father, grandfather, or great-grandfather. You can work on them. you got breath in your lungs. Get them them straight. Straighten Straighten your act up and be what God wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you for the fact that you are a good, good Father. That you love us so unconditionally and without any sort of conditions other than that we serve and love you and, and we just surrender to you. That's all you want from us. God, today I pray that you would be with fathers, you would be with those, uh, whether they're a, a father by by biologically our father just in in presence help them to be what you want them to be and god we pray all these things in jesus name amen